Hey everyone, welcome to Zeal. So glad you could join us today. I'm just so excited to continue on. We've been, as a church, going through some of our values as a church, what makes us Zeal. And um, if you missed the first two messages, you can always um, search for Zeal Movement on YouTube and go catch those messages. But uh, today I wanted to dive into week three, um, something that really um, is burning on our hearts as a church and something that we feel so strongly about um, is this idea that Jesus came to give us an abundant life, that we as believers uh, were not just saved so that we could go to heaven, but Jesus came to give us an abundant life. And why we feel this is such a pivotal message for this time is that uh, we live in an orphaned world. We live in a fatherless generation. We live in a time where people are uh, bound by sin and bound by depression and anxiety and fear and suicidal thoughts and and just uh, everything that comes along with Um, not having a father, not having a mother and, and just feeling worthless or whatever it is that the enemy tries to, to throw at us. And, and we're just bombarded by this all the time. And, and we believe that, uh, now is the time for us to really understand who we are in Christ and everything that he paid for. So I just want to open us up in prayer and then we're just going to dive into the word today. So Holy Spirit, we love you. Jesus, thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you for everything that you've purchased for us on the cross. And today I ask God that you would uh, begin a mighty work of freedom and healing for everyone listening today. I thank you that you paid for us to have an abundant life in Christ. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to uh, start off in, in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, and I won't go into the whole story, but this scripture basically says it's Jesus speaking of himself saying, for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. It says that the son of man left heaven, left all of glory and came down to earth for this very reason to seek and to save every single person that was lost. He's on a mission. He's praying day and night uh, for the lost to be found. It's, it's what's on the heart of God. And, you know, I think a lot of times when we think of this word save, the word save in this scripture, it means much more than just salvation. (laughs) Now, how many of you know, if it was just salvation, that would be enough. But Jesus, in his goodness, in his Uh, his goodness and his love for us. He said, no, I'm not just here to save you for eternity. I'm here to uh, pave the way for you to have an abundant life. And that word save in, uh, it actually means it's this word sozo. And and this word sozo, many of you have heard this term before, but it, it actually means to save, to heal and to deliver. And when Jesus says the son of man has come to save, to seek and to save that which was lost, he's, he's letting us know it's not just salvation. It's, I want to come and I want to give you new life in me, but I also want to bring you healing in every way possible in your spirit, in your soul, in your body. And I want to deliver you from every uh, power of darkness, everything that the enemy tries to throw at you. I'm going to be your deliverer. And he's causing us to see that we, the enemy comes to steal, kill and destroy. But Jesus came to give us an abundant life. It means that we as believers, we're not supposed to walk around a depressed, downtrodden, defeated. We're not supposed to have a mindset that says, well, oh, the enemy is so powerful. Darkness is all around us. No, no. He says, I've come to give you an abundant life a victorious life, that you have victory over sin, that you have victory in your life because of what I purchased. And um, it's this, this process of becoming more free. You see, conversion happens immediately. 
Like the moment that you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Bible says that you were once dead, but now you are alive in Christ. The moment that you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, the moment you are water baptized, when you have the experience of going under the water as a dead person and coming up as a resurrected new creation in Christ, that moment is like this. It's a, it's a snap of a finger. It is immediate. But then there's this process of transformation. And um, it, it's, it's this process. It's a lifelong process of being transformed into the image of Christ. And that's something that's going to last our whole lives. Like here on this side of eternity, we're never going to be able to say, well, I'm fully like Jesus. I've, I've arrived. I am, I'm fully like him. No, it's not going to happen until we see him face to face, whether he comes on the clouds or whether he takes us home before then. There is a process of being transformed into his likeness and becoming more like him. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 16, it says, Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the spirit of the Lord. So in other words, I'm free when I receive Jesus, but I'm going from glory to glory. I'm being becoming more free and more free and more like Jesus and more like Jesus. I mean, man, I remember a season of my life um, when my husband and I were going through our premarital counseling and we were receiving a lot of healing. We were re- going through a lot of uh, inner healing stuff, going through pulling up stuff from our past, things that we had walked through, things that we had experienced that God wanted to bring healing to. And it was an intense time. It was it was a lot of work of, of just saying, okay, God, heal these places in my heart. Um, and, and it was a season of life where we were really getting free from a lot of stuff. But I want to tell you, I'm still getting free from stuff. And we're all going to, as we're on this process of becoming more like him, Holy Spirit is bringing up stuff to lead us into greater levels of freedom every day. You know, I like to um, think about it like this, the process of adoption. I know many people in our church um, either do foster care or have gone through the process of adoption um, or are very familiar with it. And, you know, there's this, this thing that happens when a child has been an orphan for their whole life. And then all of a sudden, this family comes along and says, I'm going to bring this child into my family. You know, I love this, uh, the story of... Um, of Heidi Baker. She's a missionary to Mozambique, Africa. And she tells the story of, she brings in lots of of children into her family. And she'll often say that she can immediately tell the difference between um, those who have been adopted for a long time and those who are newly adopted. Because the ones that are newly adopted are very timid. They walk around the house like as on eggshells kind of. They're trying to figure out their environment. They're trying to figure out what's okay, what's not okay. They, you know, they they ask for everything and just make sure things that are okay. And she said the kids that have been in our family for a long time, they just bust into the house. They open up the fridge. They grab a soda. They you know, kick up their feet. They make themselves at home. Why? Because they know that this is my family now. I am a son. I am a daughter. And I think, man, this is what it's like in the kingdom. That although at conversion, we become a daughter and a son of of the king, there's something that has to happen up here to help to, for us to know, like, man, I'm not an orphan any longer. I don't have to do the things that I once did when I was living in darkness. Now I am a child of God. And there's a mentality that goes along with being a child of God. And the mindset that I had as an orphan no longer works for me as, as one that's been adopted. And that's the process of freedom. It's the process of letting go of all of the things that I used to do when I had to be my own provider, I had to look out for myself, I had to find validation and worth in the things of the world, but now 
I'm a child of God. And now God's my provider. Now God is the one that fulfills my every need and desire. Now God is the one that pours his love into me so that I don't have to go looking for love in other places. But that process takes time and it happens up here. Freedom is the process of understanding everything that's available to you in Christ. It's training your mind to think, man, I'm not an orphan anymore. I am, I'm now a child of God. And as believers, we have a responsibility to get free. Why? Because number one, Jesus paid for it. And I don't know about you, but I want the fullness of what he paid for. But secondly, um, When we're bound by things, when we're bound by fear, it affects everyone around us. It affects, if you're married, it affects your spouse. How many of you have ever felt like, man, why does he do that thing? Or why does she do that? And oftentimes it goes back to a wound that you have in your heart or a fear that has come about. And man, it's just one simple prayer, one healing of the heart away from that thing being resolved, your marriage gets better when you get free. Your your parenting gets better when you get free. How many of you don't want to repeat the same patterns that your parents did to you that you would say, well, I never will be like that or I'll never do that. And, And yet you find yourself having the same sort of reactions. It's like Jesus paid for that so that you don't have to continue in these same patterns. But Even on a larger scale, we as believers need to get free because we live in an orphaned world. We live in a world where we just look around and people are um, lost. They're depressed. The anxiety and and the suicide rates are at an all-time high and people don't know how to deal with their pain. So they turn to the things of the world to numb their pain, whether it's drugs or alcohol or sex or Uh, even when those things don't work anymore, it's, I I feel like I want to end my life. And we are surrounded by a world that doesn't know how to cope with the pain that they've experienced. They don't know how to go to Jesus and get healing from their trauma. And so we as believers, we've got to go and get free. We've got to know what it means to live an abundant life because we can't take anybody that we haven't been and anywhere we haven't been. We can't take anyone somewhere that we haven't personally been to. And so I want to, I want to, um, urge you today. If there's, you know, I know in a 15, 20 minute message, I'm not going to be able to walk everybody through the healing that they need. But my hope and my prayer today is that you would leave this message and say, man, I need to go deeper in this. I need to get free in the areas that I've, I am bound up in. And so I want to have you turn, um, in John chapter nine, John chapter nine, Um, And before I go here, I just want to say that um, freedom has very little to do with your circumstances and it has much to do with how you respond to circumstances. Now, how many of you know Paul wrote uh, much of the New Testament in a prison cell? So on the, the, on the outside, he really wasn't free. He was bound in chains. He was in a, in a prison cell, but spiritually he was free. He was free. He was not allowing his circumstances to dictate his mindset, to dictate how God would use him. He was not a defeated person. He was victorious. He said, you know what? I know what it's like to have a lot and a little. I know what it's like to be hungry and I know what it's like to be well fed. I know what it's like to be in chains and I know what it's like to be free. But I, through all of these circumstances, I have found the secret to being content. And man, it's like, it doesn't matter as much what happens to you. All of us have gone through things in our life, traumatic events, um, things that have caused us hurt and wounds and, and all of these things. It's less about, about what has happened to you. And it's more about, uh, how you've responded, how the, the voice of the enemy has come in, in those low moments Um, to speak lies to you that that you've just believed your whole life and have formed um, a whole mindset around these lies. And and I want to point you to this um, story in John chapter 9, and I won't read the whole thing, but um, 
It says, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, stop here. How, like... (laughs) How discouraging, you know, someone that is saying, well, is he, is he blind because he sinned or because his parents sinned? And Jesus is like, well, hold up here. <laughs> he's not blind because of sin. He's not blind because of anything that he did or his parents did. So don't just go assuming that, that there's just a curse on him because of his sin. That's not the case. He said, um, he said that, He's blind that the works of God should be revealed in him. He's going through this trial to display the goodness of God. It says, um, he goes on to say, when he had said these things, he spit on the ground and made clay with the saliva and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Now, I don't know if any of you have wondered, like I have, like why on earth would Jesus, after coming in contact with this blind man, spit on the ground, make clay with his spit, and then put it on the man's eyes? Like how disgusting is that? You know, and a lot of people just, we like to, um, we love formulas and we're like, oh, well, maybe if I, um, if I come in contact with this person that's blind, I'll just spit in the ground and put it on their eyes and they'll be healed. And it's like, no, there was a reason why Jesus did this. And as I studied this out further, I came to the uh, revelation that for this man to be blind meant that he most likely would have been begging um, on the streets and that as people would walk by him, they would spit on him as he as they walked by. Why? Because they thought that it was because of his sin that he was blind. So people, as they walked by, they would just spit on him, saying, "You know, you're a sinner. You're no good. You're you did this. You did that," and just would spit on him, saying, "Basically, you're worthless." And he had to face that day in and day out. And so when Jesus got to him. When, when Jesus came face to face with this man that was blind for years, when Jesus spit in the dirt, it would have brought back the trauma of everything that Jesus or the, that this man had faced for years and years and years. When Jesus spit into the ground, he, he, it would have brought back the woundings of, of everyone spitting on him. It would have stirred up something, the the trauma, the rejection that he faced, the feeling of being worthless and, and the feeling of like shame. That would have been stirred up when Jesus spit into the ground. And this man would have thought in his mind, most likely, oh, it's just another, it's just another person coming to spit on me. But Jesus spits in the dirt and the very thing that was used to wound this man, Jesus used to bring his healing. Like, man, this, this blows my mind at the goodness of Jesus, that he would bring up that, that trauma and that that very thing would be used to bring this man's healing. That Jesus, when he put uh, the clay on the man's eyes, he said, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. When he went and washed in the pool of Siloam, it says that he went and washed and came back seeing. Now, when he thinks, when he hears the sound of of someone spitting, he's never going to think of of the wounding anymore. Now, when he hears the sound of someone spitting, he's going to remember the goodness of Jesus. He's going to think about his healing and how Jesus made him whole. And I just love that about Jesus, that he didn't just care about healing his eyesight because he could have done it any way. He could have healed him in any way possible. He could have just laid his hands on him or he could have just said, be healed like he did many times. But he cared about healing his heart, not just his body. And that's the same for you and me. Jesus knows. He knows the trauma that you've been through. He knows the situations that you've been through. He knows that the people that have failed you, the people that walked out on you, the people, the things that happened to you, he knows those things. 
and he's ready and willing to heal your heart from the trauma. Uh, and not just, you know, many people have pain in their body, which a lot of times is coming out of the overflow of a, a real pain in your heart. And Jesus is saying to you today, I want to heal you from the inside out. I want to heal not just your body, but I want to heal your heart too. I want to break off the shame. I want to, I want to show you that I was there in that moment. I was there when those people were walking by spitting on you. I was there when that person left you. I was there when that person abused you. And I want to heal those places in your heart so that you don't have to keep walking in the pain and you don't have to numb the pain on your own. I want to take it away. I want to be the one that heals you. 